Uh, hey, Megan. Hey, Matt. How's it going? Uh, good. It's going pretty good. Um, you know, I've, I've just been uh, getting over a, a, a terrible cold I, I had the, the, the past couple weeks, but uh, but now I'm all good. Yes, I think we have the same cold actually. Yes, a vicious Seems to have been making rounds of everybody lives in Washington D.C. and blogs. Uh, something like that. No, you know, I just I, I, I've sort of um, you know I've, I've been sick before, obviously, but 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 for years these sort of colds would kind of like pass through my, my social group and I would escape usually almost almost unscathed. Uh, and then, um, you know, when I, I quit smoking for, for the new year and I, I was promised fewer respiratory ailments, but instead they've, they've just sort of come worse. Um, See, that is a vicious lie. I had the same experience when I quit smoking. Um, I, I actually developed a theory at one point that, that if smoking was bad for me, it had to be really bad for bacteria which was then triumphantly vindicated when I quit smoking and started, I mean, God knows what was coming out of my lungs. It's like the, the abyss of, of um, dangerous, deadly bacteria. Right. I, you know, I, 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 I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense because you figured smoking, you know, there's a lot of toxins and whatnot in the tobacco. And, and as we know, you know, they can kill a, a, an adult human being over the course of a few decades. But like a tiny, tiny bacteria is going to die like, like super fast, right? Exactly. They don't have like livers. No, no. They've got nothing. Lungs. Nothing. Um, so, you know, I mean, there, there's a lesson in this for, for the kids, um, the kids out there, which, of course, is, is to, you know, keep keep smoking. Don't, don't give up. Don't, don't listen to the quitters and the haters out there. Um, they don't know. <laughs> That's right. A, a, a winner never quits and a quitter never wins. Right, exactly. They, they, Look, they don't I mean, if you, if you quit smoking, you could end up like us. <laughs> yes. It's terrible. And, and you know, not only uh, was the... The, the, the sickness itself bad, but for, for days, uh, you know, the medicine I was taking, I had like a Dayquil and NyQuil, and it, it was doing nothing. And then it was mm -hmm. thanks to a post, I read a post on your blog about um, the process of buying Sudafed under the new regime. And it was at that point that I realized that I hadn't been going through any such difficult process. And, uh, you know, Dayquil and Nyquil had just sort of surreptitiously taken the, uh, what's it called, pseudoephedrine? Yes. The, 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 the real name for that. They, they'd taken that ingredient out, and they put in instead something else called, um, um, let me see, look at my box. Um, it was called, uh, mm, I can't see. See, this, this is the, the lesson box. for you, Matthew. If you've been watching more television... You would have seen the commercials full of all these cough medicines who were like, you know, Dayquil let itself get rid of this active cough ingredient so it could stay on the shelf. But we are better than that. And that's why you now have to go to the, the pharmacy and present ID and sign and submit to a cavity search and a background check um, in order to get, you know, a box of 12 Sudafed. Right. Well, no, you know, it gets worse than that, uh, my, 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 my tale of regulatory disaster, which was that... Um, oh, yeah. Right, so I went. I, I, I read your blog, and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. Um, I went to, to the Rite Aid. I went back to the prescription counter, and I got uh, some Sudafed, and I figured I would buy the 12-hour Sudafeds, because, you know, how convenient. Um, so I get the box, I sign the thing, I take one, um, and then I go to a, a coffee shop where, where I usually work, and I'm there, and, you know, hours later, I'm back at home, and I realize... I have left my Sudafeds in the coffee shop and, and oh, lost no. them. And now, of course, because I'm there in the book, I can't go buy anymore. Or they're going to conclude that I'm running a meth lab in the house. <laughs> so I had to get uh, my roommate and, and your uh, blocking chef antagonist, Spencer Ackerman, to make an illicit straw purchase of Sudafed for me. <laughs> Well, luckily, Spencer's up to a rock for a month, so presumably by the time he gets back and is himself in need of Sudafed, they'll have cleared the book. Yeah, no. Actually, I don't know how long it lasts. Well, they actually say, I mean, the book itself, I saw in the fine print, they're supposed to preserve for, like, a year. Um, I mean, I well, assume you're allowed to re-up on the Sudafed sooner than that. Um, yeah, because I've definitely bought at least two boxes uh, since I've been in D.C., but I just find, I find the whole thing... Um, I don't know what your take on this is, but I find it entirely ridiculous. I mean, first of all, because, um, you know, what little I know about, about the drug actual impacts of this is all it's done is shift meth production to Mexico, which I guess 
as a poverty reduction strategy may be a great idea because now we're you know we're shipping the jobs abroad to poor Mexicans who probably need them more than the uh, the Americans in trailer parks who were originally making them out. Um, but the fact that just the, the huge national wastage of energy that we now have to go to to prevent like five people in Mississippi from making meth just just stirs every every libertarian fiber of my soul. Right. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll 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 say something about this. Not not in defense of policy, but, but against. Uh, not even really against libertarians. But you know, I read um, like uh, Reason Magazine has uh, like near, near near the front of the book like a, a kind of section where they do a lot of like um, sort of examples of stupid regulations that have been adopted somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. and, and my most like sort of annoying libertarian acquaintance will also do this every time I see her sort of like regale me with the tale of some like bad regulation that was implemented somewhere. And I'm Dare always I like, ask oh, who okay. your most annoying libertarian acquaintance is, or is this one of those? What? No, why? Well, I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for this forum. Right. So go on. Um, but you know, I, and I mean, I, I guess I agree with that. I mean, there, there's a lot of sort of dumb dumb regulations out there that, that really should be gotten rid of. And I, I feel like the tragedy of it is that I, I don't feel like when the Republican Party gets into power, they actually get rid of any of these things. And not not just in the sense that, like, they're too timid and politically moderate, right? But that, like, you know, the, the, the regulations they're interested in deregulating are sort of, you know... I mean, they're, they're the ones that someone is going to give them sort of giant sacks of money to get rid of, which which aren't tend not to be the same as the sort of most pointless ones that were just introduced by by media hysterics. Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of disagree with you on that because I think that uh, I mean, and although I will I will give bipartisan credit if you look to at what happened in, in the late eighty in the late seventies uh, and, and the eighties. There's actually a pretty strong argument that there were a lot of you know, deregulation in airlines and trucking, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, all of these industries that have been heavily regulated that were deregulated where you've now seen prices fall and so forth. I mean, you and I, uh, certainly as uh, young journalists, fly probably a lot more, uh, certainly for our personal time than we ever would have under regulated airlines when 70% of Americans have never been on an airplane. Um, so I think that, that it's not that it never happens, but it's hard to it's hard to make it happen. Um, I don't think that the case of drug policy, you know, I, I'm more than happy to bash Republicans on drug policy. Um, I can't say that I think they're worse than Democrats, but I, I'm, I'm happy to, to bash both parties. I no, I mean I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not policy. saying they're worse either. It's just that you know I would you would sort of like it to be right that you know. It should be both possible for me to, you know, have, um, you know, prefer the Democrats, generally speaking, to think, you know, well, this this is the good party. Um, but that the Republicans should, at the same time, should have some, some distinctive virtues of their own. Like, I think it would be really great if what happened when Republicans secured, you know, undominated you know, c- c- complete control of the government is that, you know, some bad things, some things that I hate happen, but at least, right, they could, like, clear out the dead brush of the, of, of the regulatory state, you know, and attack most most uh, viciously sort of the least justified uh, among these policies. Um, but instead it seems to me to, to, to be the reverse, right, that they're, um, you know, the sort of, the, the major deregulations, like like with the airlines, that involve sort of tackling major entrenched interests, um, you know, are precisely the ones that um, you know get done in a in a bipartisan way that had a lot of. I mean, there was a lot of lefty support back in, in the seventies for, for for some of those kinds of things. Whereas, like in in recent years, I mean, I, I haven't seen the Bush administration. I must have missed the lefty support for deregulating trucking and airlines. Everything I've read has been pretty much across the board, like nationalize them, not uh, from the period. It's nationalize them, not. Well, I don't know, them. lefty. I mean, maybe wrong. I mean, the Carter administration uh, did much of this stuff, right? I mean, Ralph Nader was a supporter of, of some of these deregulations. Ted Kennedy was a sponsor in Congress of some of them. At least that that, that was my understanding when I when I, I was reading these Reagan biographies uh, a couple of years ago, and they emphasized that there was a kind of continuity in, um, 
a lot of the things he did on that front with, with oh yeah and Carter gets um, I mean I will say Carter just gets really unfairly slammed for his economic policies in fact Carter did two great things he appointed Paul Volcker um, who was the guy who actually wrestled America's inflation to the ground and beat it with a bat until it finally died um, or at least you know sort of shrank down, back down to an acceptable size and he also he spearheaded a lot of, of deregulation including the airlines that uh, he gets absolutely no credit for from conservatives and, and, and is mostly unfairly maligned on that on that side of it. So right, and you know, I mean obviously he I mean he tends not to get credit for it per se for, from, from from liberals either. Um, but you know, I mean <laughs> Uh, well, although I mean, you should. I mean, you know, it, I mean, it, it, it gets to be a kind of you know weird thing where uh, the liberals, uh, I guess, find it distasteful to ever say that like that there was a policy which had some liberal support and which turned out well, just because it's not like a, a, a liberal policy, you know, as right. such. Um, but you know, all I'm saying is, is this whole pseudo Fed thing. It happened under Republican watch. Uh, you know, they're supposed to be like looking out for my unfettered right to potentially. But not on drugs, right? Like, I mean, the the problem with the Republicans, and one of the reasons I didn't vote for them last election, is that they, um, you know, they they do pursue what I think of as largely victimless crimes, especially drugs. Um, I mean, I don't say that that. The drug industry doesn't cause a tremendous amount of damage because I think it does, but I think that it causes a tremendous amount of damage for mostly the reason that it's prohibited and thus offers this opportunity for sort of young men who don't want to get jobs flipping burgers or whatever to you know wreak violence on each other in pursuit of, of excess profits from prohibition. Um, so it's you know the problem. My thing. I'd be happy to vote for Democrats on drugs, but they suck just as badly as the Republicans do. I mean, they're no, there's sure, no sure. there's no daylight one. between these guys. Um, and then you know the, the the question then becomes. Part of it is uh, for I think for libertarians at this point, why do libertarians vote Republican? If they're just trying to forestall more regulation from the Democrats. It's not that the Republicans undo any of it; they just don't do more of it. Perhaps one thing uh, uh, Republicans or Libertarians are trying to forestall is um, uh, a, a massive outpouring of uh, new new trade union organizing. Um, if, the, if the Democrats uh, just just passed in the House um, uh, a, a sort of labor law reform package, um, so I guess the the headline item is this thing involving. Um, making the, the, the card check uh, union process much more um, uh, readily available. Um, and this is going to go to the Senate, where I believe it's uh, destined to be filibustered to death. Um, but certainly, you know, the Democrats have become very committed to, to this particular um, sort of cause, and if they gain more political power after 2008, uh, it'll presumably happen. Um, and you think that's terrible. Uh, well, there's two things. I'm not sure it'll happen because it's got to go past the Senate, right? Which is a big hurdle. Right. Um, no, I mean, I mean, Democrats, I mean you, Democrats you, you're going to have need... to pick up senators in, in pretty rugged right to work states. You know, Carter, the card check was turned down by the Carter administration. It's not a new plan. And if, if right. you couldn't get it through the Carter administration, I'm kind of skeptical that you're going to get it through now. Um, that said, you know, I'm like, I, I think that, uh, yeah, the Democrats think are, are hoping to rebuild. Um, they're hoping to rebuild the union movement, uh, and the way that you know the libertarians certainly look at it is that right now they're hoping to rebuild a, a union movement by making it a whole lot easier for unions to coerce workers who don't want to join unions into joining anyway, um, by sort of identifying who the holdouts are, so that there so that other coworkers can put social pressure, um, and you know there are out, certainly allegations of threats of physical violence that are more than allegations on the East Coast where unions tend to have some involvement with the mob uh, in some cases. Um, All right, so well, but I, I mean, I, I know you've, you've gone through a, a couple a couple rounds with this on, 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 on blogs and uh, have no doubt seen the, the, the studies uh, people have linked to about... Um, you know, the, the fact that there have been car check elections, there have been these, these NLRB uh, election things, there's much less harassment uh, on aggregate reported in these things. You know, because obviously... But the problem is, no, right, no, like you've got two, as, problems, you, you've got two big problems with those studies. And sure. the first problem is that the car check elections, by definition, are more amicable they're, because they're elections where the company agreed to it. Right, um, right. No, I, and I, second I, of all, that the way that those studies define like intimidation 
is definitely open to, for example, if a company says to you, look, if you get the, if this union comes in, they can't keep you from closing the plant and moving it elsewhere, and they can't guarantee you a raise. Right? Those things are both true, and I would argue those are things that the workers should hear. Because the fact is, if you get a union and it succeeds in resting wage increases out, one of the things you have to think about is there are other places that that factory could be um, where the union isn't. Sure, sure, um, sure. But I mean, but I mean, the the, the point, the, the, um, the, the the real point there is that the is same that, as threatening to like you know make someone someone's life hell at work or threatening or keying their car or I mean is, is sure, that but really okay, the same okay, okay. thing? But, 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 but I mean, you're making it look like I mean companies regular, constant. If you try and organize a union, right, if I am there in the workplace and it, it, it's believed that I am a hotbed of pro-union sentiment, my employer is going to make my life hell at work. I mean, I mean this is the whole point, is that it, it, it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't deny that, you know, people are going to, uh, union organizers are, uh, you know, going to try and get people to, to join the union. Um, you know, and but the only really coercive things a union organizer can do to uh, a, a worker are, you know, you were raising the specter of um, hiring the mob to take hits out on them. Which, you know, no, I mean, no, not hiring the mob to take hits out on them. Some of them, the unions on the East Coast, are in fact like subsidiaries of the mob. It's not like I, you hire the mob. This okay, is a mob. Well, look, this is, I, I mean, I think, you know, wildly outdated. You know, uh, uh, stereotype of, of what's happening here. But you know, but, but, but be that as it may, I mean, what you're talking about is that people can go just completely outside the bounds of the law. I mean, the mob is a criminal organization, so on and so forth. It's standard business operating procedure for companies, which obviously have huge amount of leverage over their employees to, um, you know, fire them if they are. Uh, trying to organize unions to, you know, or at a minimum, if they don't think they can get away with that, to change your shifts around, to take your good extra hours away, so on and so forth. Um, you know, and uh, they say that, I mean, the, the Bush administration's labor secretary was giving in some speech when he was emphasizing their commitment to helping block this law, you know, referred to the, the fact that his constituents in the business community want the ability to, uh, you know, threaten and intimidate um, union organizers, which I think is understandable. I mean, if, if I was the manager of a, you know, a gigantic service sector firm, uh, I would really, 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 really not want my uh, employees to, to form a union. Okay, and here's a question, right? Like, in some ways, this is being pitted as, like, a battle between the union organizers and the company. And I don't, you know, what about the workers? And, and for me, the, the question is, to the extent that you're, and, and you know, we could debate for a very long time, um, no doubt until our readers' ears bled, our listeners' ears bled, um, you know, sort of the, the theory of, of whether the union should be allowed this covers of power, especially to the state and so forth. And, um, but just basically, you know, the idea is, right, you're supposed to have a union because the workers want it. Sure. Um, and so saying that because the battle between the companies and the unions is somehow going wrong, that the answer is to give the unions more power to intimidate the workers. Well, no, 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 no. Megan, by no, revealing no, no, no. what they're doing the seems problem, to me to be... Megan, if the problem is that right now there is overwhelming power on the side of corporations, which there is, that right now, even when workers would like a union, they cannot get one because companies have overwhelming power to crush organizing efforts, then yes, changing the law to shift the balance of power more in favor of union organizers is the answer. I mean, I, you Okay, know, but changing I, the law in a way that opens up the workers to intimidation doesn't seem to me to be the no, right no, way to do it. No, 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 it reduces the level of intimidation that the workers can be exposed to. We, we just went through why that study doesn't work particularly well. But Let's just say, like, why not, why not change, why not, why not stiffen the penalties for doing these things that you claim the companies are doing? Why not welcome. shorten the election period? Uh, I mean, there's lots of other ways that you could rectify it that yes, would not yes. involve I, I, saying I, I, to I, workers, you have to sign in front of your co-worker okay, who, is I, going, I, I who is clearly agree. wants this I union. I completely agree. If instead of this, we could put really incredibly draconian financial and criminal penalties against people, I mean, if that's what you sign up for. I, but, you know, in, in, in the political world, you take the compromises that are available. The business groups who have been leading... They're not the doing something wrong. I mean, you're, you're, no, you're no, 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 no
that the card check there would create a new status quo, which would be superior to the current one. I agree right, with that. Right, but that's just an instrumental. I mean, like, I have a procedural no, objection. No, 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 no. It's not no, an that, instrumental that, objection. Right, yes, I don't I, have an outcome I'm trying to yes, get to. I, I think procedural that that situation would be fairer than the current one with the current penalties. I will agree with you that there may be third options where you preserve the basic the sort of election format, but radically shorten the period, stop making it the case that the NLRB board is just sort of stacked with union busters, if you radically increase the penalties, so on and so forth. You know, if that kind of a compromise bill were on the table, I would say okay. that's the right one to do. If I were in the Senate, you know, I think it would be great to try and forge a compromise like that. The business lobby, though, has made it clear that they are opposed that if you just completely took the car check element out of the current bill that's on the table, that they would fight just the increases in penalties, so on and so forth. So, insofar as we have a well, primary yeah. choice... I mean, they're going to fight it, but that doesn't mean they'll win. No, uh, not, I mean, no you know, saying, I'm sure the unions are, are, are prepared to fight all sorts of things. Unions like to fight corruption investigations of unions. That doesn't mean right, either right, that right, corruption right. investigations of unions are, are bad or that they're going to win. No, no, that. no, I, um, I, 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 I agree, but I'm saying that I'm not going to oppose what I think would be a change for the better just because there might be some pie-in-the-sky third thing that's better still. Well, I guess I have two things here. I mean, the first is you're saying this is going to happen when Democrats come in. And presumably when the Democrats come in and they have all this power, if they can get card check, they could get those other things more easily because card check is quite controversial. Sure. Well, um, say, I'm not saying it will definitely happen. I'm saying it would happen if the Democrats got their votes for it. I mean, I, right, I don't... But I would assume it would be easier to pass increased penalties for companies than it would be to pass card check, which is, again, quite sure. controversial. The I other, mean, this... this the other thing is that, that I would say, like, if this is so great, why don't we have our, our elections this way? You know, why don't we vote for president this way? If it's well, so fantastic to allow people who really care about the outcome to go around collecting your vote right there and then mm -hmm. hand it in for you. Well, I, I, I um, think that we probably use different procedures for different kinds of elections because they're different. I mean, for example, we don't use a secret ballot when we have... Um, corporate board meetings. We don't use a secret ballot. But that's because ballot. most people don't attend the corporate board meetings. Right, right, right. We, we, but I mean, we, we, that's we, also a voluntary but, association. Sure, sure, sure. We don't have a secret ballot when we have U.S. senators vote. I mean, I think the reason for that is obvious, because the constituents right. are supposed to be able to hold them accountable. But, but I mean, there are tons and tons of different voting procedures that okay, are used but for different in what kinds way, of situations. In what way is this vote? Distinguishable from a vote for president. I mean, it's essentially the same thing, right? You were attempting to no, find out it's, it's, it's the not true will of it's, each individual on this question, and that's why we have secret ballots because that makes it easier for people to express their true will. It's free it's, of coercion it's it's from it, it, it's not the same because it would not be free of coercion because there's a difference between an election between two political parties and an election between two sides where one of the sides is your employer. Different kinds of rules need to apply, which is why there was an NLRB process in the first place, you know, complete with the secret ballot to try and maintain um, the sort of neutrality you're looking for. But, I mean, I think we've seen over the decades that the NLRB process that exists doesn't work, that it's essentially impossible to organize a union, even though there's very little evidence that this is because absolutely nobody in America would like to be in a union. Well, in fact, until very recently, there is evidence that only a minority of people wanted unions in America, and that's why one of the many reasons it's been so hard to organize. So there's lots of reasons it's hard to organize right now. Sure. And I mean, that's another thing. It's like, do I, I, you know, as an economics writer, I think that the, the hope that, that my Democratic friends um, are holding out for this in terms of unionization is way overblown. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems with organizing unions, and the fact is, People trying to organize a plant, even if the employer doesn't say anything, can see that if you're in a vulnerable industry, demanding 30% higher wages is probably a good way to get your factory sent to China. Sure, um, but I mean... Even, if, I mean, even if the company never says a thing about it. Right, right, but this is why... I, I mean, I, I think everybody understands that. I think it's very unlikely that you would see a factory in a vulnerable industry a, form a union, and then B, follow that up by demanding a 30% hike in wages. I think the reason that you see people, certainly the reason that I am interested in this, is that, y you know, since the high tide of union organizing came and went, and since, uh, you know, the 
what was the what's the forty the Taft Hartley Act and the current procedures came into place that have made it very hard to, to organize. Entirely new industries have sprung into being. Industries which are not vulnerable and industries where we think uh, it, it seems to us that there is in principle a lot of scope for unionization efforts and at least modest increases in pay and better working conditions, and that would be probably in large retail facilities um, and certain kinds of personal service, you see. Um, certainly in hotels, right, there are unionized hotels in many uh, parts of the country, usually where the local sort of confluence of political forces is favorable to that. And, you know, there could be many more. Um, this is not an industry that's going to be, uh, you know, outsourced to uh, China, if you do it. Um, it's true that, you, I mean, it, the high tide of industrial manufacturing unionism is not going to come back no matter what you do because American manufacturing is dying anyway. Um, but that's not really what this is about. Well, but I, mean, I think that part of the problem, right, is unions add overhead. Um, so for a union to be a good value proposition to a worker, they have to be able to, they have to, be able to secure pretty, pretty big increases in wages and so forth. Because you've got to pay, you know, whatever it is, 60 bucks uh, every two weeks out of your wages to the union to support the, the union's overhead. Um, and in those industries that you're naming, there's a lot less scope. Because, if you, I mean, manufacturing has a lot of reasons that it was relatively easy to organize. It's very hard to exit manufacturing because there's a high capital investment. It's very hard to move an auto plant somewhere else. Right. Um, and, but it's also, the, the labor is a relatively low cost of, of the total picture. I mean, that's obviously changed in those union industries. But when they were unionizing, labor was a relatively low cost compared to, say, your huge machines, your electric mm -hmm. bill, your water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in retail, labor is the dominant cost. And so your scope to raise wages is much lower, which means that the value that you can offer, offer um, any individual union member is much lower because you can't give them a 30% raise and then take 10% off the top to run the union. And then the other problem is that, that I mean, and you know, this is sort of a victory for liberals. The government's taken over a lot of the stuff that unions used to do, right. like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and, and, and those things. The union, the government is pushed into with OSHA, with harassment laws, with environmental laws, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the areas that people used to look to unions were 401ks. You no longer need union pensions as much. Um, and, of course, union pensions have turned out to be a, a huge issue for unions, as I'm, I'm sure you're well aware. I mean, they're, they're one of the big problems the Teamsters are facing um, with the, uh, the multi-union plan, with, with, uh, with the multi-employer plan, with, with UPS and so forth. That in fact, like a lot of these unions have started to look like GM. They've got a lot of old workers supporting a narrower young work base, and they're actually, that's one of their big problems organizing, is why don't you join my union so that you can your wages can go to pay for the 70,000 old people that I need to support. Um, so the, there's just a lot of reasons that it's hard to unionize. I don't think that, um, you know, there's some scope, but, you know, unionize Walmart. What are you going to get for it? You're not going to get wages up to Costco. Costco is a completely different labor model. In the right, right. Well, that, look, but, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the potential future scope for union organizing if the laws would, I, I mean, it's it's inherently unknowable. Um, but, I mean, it, it, the way any of these things go, uh, some people are going to be overly optimistic. Um, it, probably people who are inclined to be overly optimistic about the potential scope of union organizing are people who, the sort of people who are currently in union organizing. Unions, or, yes. <laughs> co 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 close to trade unions. And I'm sure, you know, if the car check ever passes, you know, some people will see themselves disappointed. Um, I don't have a great deal, you know, at stake personally in, in the question of, you know, how much success could they have. Um, I would like to see them, you know, given, a, shall we say, a square shot at it, um, you know, um, because I think it could have beneficial uh, impacts on the country. Um, but, um, well, I don't know. Per perhaps you went at it this topic. I guess, I guess to me, I, I, like, I'll, I'll wrap up and then we should probably... But, you know, the, the real issue is that, to me, card check is wrong. You know, when a union right. organizer goes out there uh, with a card, they've got the hand of the state behind them. The state is now enforcing their ability to do that, to go to you and demand that you sign yes or no. Um, and that leaves... And, and that is why, to me, that's different from a shareholder election. Shareholder elections can be secret if they want to be. 
they're organized. Mm -hmm. They're organized by the charter, and people who buy the stocks do that voluntarily. They don't have. Right. To. I mean, I guess these I are people who are now being subject to dumping by the state, and when the state is involved, I think it should be by secret ballot. Um, and you know, the instrumental the, as an instrumental thing, I think that if there are abuses to, to correct and. Yeah, that's a debate for another day. Sure. But no, I, I, I do don't want to concede something that's sort of wrong. wrong no. I mean, the actual disagreement between us is that you think this is obviously wrong, and, and I think you're being um, absurd, um, much like. <laughs> See, no, I think you actually think it's that obviously it crazy, wrong. But... And that, you, you know, I mean, completely in keeping with a, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, the biases of a libertarian economics writer. That, that, that this is completely disconnected from how the real world works and from what any actual people's uh, concerns about these things are. Um, and I, well, I, I guess I, I, thought, I thought no John one would let the company do this. this. What? No one would let the, no one, if, say we lived in a society where unions had quite a lot of power because NRLB, NLRB was extraordinarily favorable to unions. Sure. No one would agree to, that the company should be able to go and say, do you want do you want a union? Here's the card check. Why don't you? I mean, no one would think that that was an appropriate procedure. Um, yes, I, I agree. I mean, I, I I completely agree with you that my position but they agree is based it's on the idea the that there is a basic so, asymmetry between a corporation that you work for and a union which is trying to organize your factory. I mean, this is what my position is founded on: is that these are not equivalent. But even if the asymmetry ran the other way, you wouldn't want it corrected by enabling the companies to coerce people not to join the union. No, no, no. The, the, I mean, the asymmetry between an employer and a union is inherent. I don't know that that's true. I mean, like, certainly, uh, if you look at uh, unionized industries now, the asymmetry between GM and the auto workers is pretty profound. The auto workers are draining GM, and GM, I mean, GM is ultimately going to declare bankruptcy because it cannot come to an agreement with the auto workers that will allow it to shed obligations that make it unprofitable. It's going to take all the money from the shareholders and throw it down the tubes, um, and there's nothing that GM can do about it. So it seems to me that it's clear that there are procedure, there are cases in which the asymmetry runs the other way. Um, but, yeah, but, but, that, but I just think a, like that's, it, that's not a case about power over the, the workers. I guess that what I think is that adding, giving the unions more power to coerce the workers is not the pro, not the solution to the alleged problem of management coercing the workers. The solution is to stop the management coercion. And, 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 the, and there is never a case for increasing coercion um, in the pursuit of some secret will that we don't know uh, of these workers to join unions. All right, well, um, uh, I'm ready <laughs> But we to, should move on, because I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing about this now. I'm ready to shut this down. I forget what else we said we, we were going to talk about. Uh, well, Dowries. let's see, we had, uh, we had Sudafed, we had Karchak, um, oh, Joel Klein. We had dowries. You know, I, I think some Joel Klein is in order. Joel Klein, yes. 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 Well, can you, do, do you want to, do you want to give the background of this a little bit, or shall I? Um, go, go for it. Um, a, in a, a profile of, of the new editor of Time Magazine, um, the editor was quoted as describing, uh, saying that they, they now, part of their exciting new revitalization program is they now have Joel Stein. Uh, writing on food, and that that's so good because people in their 20s and 30s worship Joel Stein as a god. Yes, um, as a god. <laughs> now, didn't, what, wasn't the line, he's a god to people in their 20s and 30s? I, I well, I mean, I realized it in, in a personal sense, obviously, in that I worship Joel Stein. Yes. Uh, I guess I just hadn't realized how widespread it was. We see, because I'm going to have to tell you, I, I, I read that, and I, or rather, I read Ross Douthat's blog, Mocking. And I think I read yours, and, and I read a few others, and I, I, I didn't know who Joel Stein was. <laughs> I'm going to confess, I read, I read a post about worshiping him as a god, and uh, I had to Google stuff about him because I had no idea who he was. Either. Yeah. I think I used to read his stuff in Time, back when I subscribed to Time, in like the Jurassic, but... Um, so, okay, so I, a friend of mine pointed out that this is where, where I know Joel Stein from, and, and this was true, baby. What 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 was he was pointing out is that he is one of the guys who's like a talking head on um, those VH1 shows, like y you know remember the eighties, yes. right? So that's that's Jill Stein. 
uh, music music nostalgia guy. Um, I, and, and I do have to say, I, I sort of have a hatred for all of those guys because I had an internship one summer that involved um, getting getting coffee and muffins for a, a dude at Rolling Stone who I, for You're years... You're I didn't know that. I've been seeing it... Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the internship was supposed to involve, you know, obviously prestigious le- learning the magazine business, but this was... I, I had to bring the guy... He, he was trying to cut down on his dairy consumption, right? But instead of taking uh-huh. skim milk in his coffee, he wanted whole cream. He just wanted a very small amount of it, you know, like a like a tiny dollop of cream. And and he wouldn't do this for himself. I had to put the tiny amount of cream in and stir the coffee and bring it to him and then be subject to criticism for not having correctly intuited the right amount of cream. That is, this is, I think, a fascinating difference because I've only, I mean, I'm, I'm weird as a journalist in that I never did any of these sort of scut internships or whatever. I basically jumped straight into working for The Economist. Right. Uh, so and the, the Economist doesn't do that to its interns. I think it's something about the movie business where you start to sort of, you write about these people for long enough and you just start to think, like, I should have a muffin boy. <laughs> yeah, something like that. No, I, you know, it's, um, it, it was unfortunate. You might have more sympathy for for, for, for the laborers out there, um, if you, if you there, had this excuse me, man. I've had some of the worst jobs. I mean, <laughs> okay. I don't say I've had. I've never like slaughtered chickens or anything, but uh-huh. uh, uh-huh. I have worked as a housekeeper at a hotel. Uh, I've been a secretary. I have. Uh, I've, I've worked the cash register at a bizarrely named. There was a chain. You may remember this actually. Um, in the eighties in New York, my very first job was as a cashier when I was 14 at a chain of pharmacies called the Love Pharmacies. Oh, sure. I have no idea what marketing genius dreamed up this name, but it was it was sort of like a failed Rite Aid, or a failed Dwayne Reed, uh-huh, really. Uh-huh. Uh, sort of sad, actually. But uh, that's, that's a New York thing. I've done my, I've done my fair fair share of scut work. I feel that I've earned my up okay. ops. As Just as not, 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 not journalism. So, you, you know, you mentioned slaughtering chickens. Uh, I, I, you know, my my grandfather was a communist, um, and he, he, his first job actually was slaughtering chickens, and he always attributed his his radical um, politics to this. And it, that's really it's weird because wonder. my grandfather's first job, uh, my grandfather grew up on a dirt farm in the Depression in upstate New York, and mm-hmm. uh, his his worst job and first job was cleaning uh, like twenty tons of rotted cabbage out of a silo. And he then worked as a grocery boy until he was 26, and he always attributed his republicanism to his hard scrabble roots, um, you know, in the in the fields of manual labor, and, and that it gives right, him an see, understanding of the value of work. I think there's a work. difference. I think there's a difference between like a hard scrabble job and a really gross one. I don't know. I mean, it's something. It's something about chicken slaughter. It's Twenty tons of rotted cabbage. Is, my, my grandfather has also slaughtered. No, chicken. that is. That's disgusting. Yeah. yeah no, I don't know. I, I, but I, I don't understand why. Okay, well, ma- maybe chicken slaughter doesn't necessarily. Well, I think grandfathers just tend to attribute all of sort of the the finer things that they think that they've achieved to uh, whatever crap job they had when they were young. Right. That could be. They're just cranks, <laughs> like Joel Stein. Much beloved cranks. Um, yes. No. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Right. Um, um, I, I can't think of a good transition to dowries. <laughs> um, I, I think Indian cranks probably complain about the fact that dowries um, are not as high as these. Well, no, actually, they're higher. This is one of the oh. one of the interesting things that I learned after I uh, I wrote a blog post about um, on on the Economist blog about Indian dowries, mm-hmm. and this is actually something that really puzzles me about both India and China. Um, which, as Matt undoubtedly knows, and probably most of our listeners, China and India have a big, there are a lot of missing girls. And there's some debate as to whether right. some of this may be due to, to hepatitis infection, but certainly a large part of it is due to the proliferation of sonograms and people aborting uh, unwanted female fetuses or committing infanticide. Um, and the interesting, so you now, you're starting to get situations in the countryside, because it's been going on for long enough, where there aren't wives for men. Um, right. And the interesting question to me as an economist who tends to assume that there's some sort of supply and demand component to everything is that you would think that this would mean that the price of women in the market would rise, right, because there's fewer of them. So theoretically, right. um, we should see dowries falling. 
or, in fact, people starting right. to pay to get rides. And, in fact, you're seeing the reverse. Uh, dowries are rising, and people now even sort of families of moderate means when their daughter gets married are expected to provide, like, 10,000 pounds of gold and a refrigerator or maybe a car, and it bankrupts them. And that actually just makes it worse because, of course, the next generation says, well, gosh, I, I can't afford to have a daughter. Um, so they abort them before they're born. There was a, in the article that I, I was linking to this, you know, there's a doctor who won't tell his, his patients the sex of the baby. Um, right. Quoted as saying that none of his cousins have had a baby, a, a female baby, in like 15 years. And so, with, on the other hand, Matt, I understand you are prepared to defend the practice of offering dowries. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally am, um, or, or so I said, you know, I am before this, um, but... Uh, you know, I, I couldn't think of, like, tons of good reasons, um, but, you know... Um, you just want money. I, I, I want money, certainly. Um, you know, I, I think pe people should give me a dowry to, to marry their daughter. It seems like a nice uh, tradition. Um, no, but, I mean, uh, I, somewhat seriously, I guess. Um, you know... I, I, I mean, as you say, it does. It, it, it raises the the, the the puzzle of why um, the the sort of market doesn't self-correct here. That if there's a shortage of women, it should be easy enough to instead of aborting your female fetus if you can't afford the dowry, just say, "Well, I can't afford the dowry, so I'm not going to offer a dowry," and your daughter will wind up getting married simply because there are, you know, um, 1.3 young men for every young woman out there, and so, you know, someone will do it. Um, you know, insofar as it, and, and, you know, viewed that way, I mean, the dowry should be, um, you know, an unobjection, unobjectionable voluntary social practice that, you know, pe people can engage in if they want to, um, except obviously, you know, it, it's not working out that way um, in the real world, which is uh, why, why we on the left are so fond of heavy-handed regulatory solutions. Well, but, you know, this is, the, this is where the libertarian points out that the reason there are no, I mean, there actually, in India, there are heavy-handed regulatory solutions, and they don't work. Um, they, they first banned amniocentesis and then sonograms and, and uh, just got, and then telling that they modified it and said you, you can't tell the sex of the baby, and none of those things have worked. Sonogram machines are cheap, they're portable, um, and people... No, 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 you need to ban the dowries, not the sonograms. Well, that's that's an interesting. But here, here's the problem, right? Is like um, when you've got a practice that has wide social acceptance, it doesn't get banned anyway. So I mean, yes, in theory, yeah, so it, as long as you're in a democracy, you can't ban something that's that popular. Um, right. The, you know, so yeah, in theory, if we could get God to come in and be like, "Hey, wait a minute, no dowry," uh, that would be fantastic. But God's not available. All we have is this government that is elected by the same fools that you're trying to stop from from making fools of themselves. But so I mean, is, is this actually true though, up up and down the board with with the dowries? That, you know, because India is um, it's such a huge country that, you know, something can affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of people while also not being anywhere near universal. Well, there's actually a lot of geographic uh, variation in this. It's mo and, but here's the weirdest right. thing to me, is I would, assume, I would have assumed it was concentrated among the poorest families, and it's not. It's, it's mm -hmm. the wealthy families that do it, and the wealthiest states that have the biggest problem because they're the ones who can afford the sonograms. Have the biggest problems with with lack of with, women with, with, yeah. with the sex selection, right? But I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I guess I, I'm just I'm, I'm wondering about about the the big dowries, the, the refrigerators, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I don't think so. You know, uh, neither of us. I'm not. I don't I mean, know enough about Indian culture to know right. how common it is. I know that whenever anyone talks about um, India and women, dowries become. You know, the, when I was in high school, there was a big campaign in India. They had a television campaign. Because brides are not for burning, um, because apparently yeah. there was right. some sort of social problem with people um, setting their brides on fire because the dowries were inadequate. Um, and like, but you know, was that widespread? I, I was told that by a teacher of mine who was Indian. But it, in a country as big as India, it's hard to in a country as big as America, it's hard to know how common anything is. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, well, this was actually why I brought it up because I I, 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 know a little something about that. The, 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 the white burning situation. And, you know, th this was exactly what I was saying. I mean, it turned out to be something where it, it, a ho this happened to a horrifying large number of people, but it was actually a marginal practice in India. 
there's just, you know, in, in a country with a billion people, a very small minorities right. uh, practices can create, you know, large sort of aggregate problems. And, uh, you know, and, and there was, this did get addressed through the, the democratic process in India. It wasn't that there was, like, mass overwhelming support. For, for, for it going on, um, and you know there was this this awareness, consciousness raising campaign that you know uh, reached a lot of us in, in the states, but you know a parallel sort of mobilization in, in India, um, you know which is what makes me wonder about the dowries. Although I guess if if the dowries are actually going up in value, right, that suggests that it, it's not like this doesn't exist in the sort of more touched by globalization parts of the country, um, but that, you know, your upscale new Indians are, are also all about the dowry. I would, I would assume that that's true, because cars and refrigerators have got to be a pretty big consumer product for most Indians, so, um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm hostage to reporting, I and mean, it's actually, it's interesting, it, what you're saying reminds me of uh, something I read today about uh, someone attempting, I can't remember whose blog it was on, I'm, I'm not going to be embarrassed to find out, like, it was yours, but um, okay. it was... <laughs> Something about how the the newspapers were trying to make it sound like there was this huge resurgence of the Klan, and they were talking about some Klan rally that had attracted 20 people. And, and to me, like 20 <laughs> Klan members is a horrifying number of Klan members. But in in the context of sure. America, you know, you, just by normal variance, you're going to have 20 crazy people who are willing to rally for something at any given time. Right. Right. Exactly. Well. Okay. But so I guess neither of us. Uh, actually know all that much about the dowries. Um, but it, it it just does seem, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I read the story you like to, and it, I, I mean, it was just, it was interesting that it didn't really attempt to, to explain, you know, I guess the, the basic market question here, which, which amounts to, you know, so what would really happen in practice if you just, you know, weren't offering a, a generous dowry? Yeah. You know? Should you be able to just go to some place where there is a, a deficit of potential brides and, you know, someone will decide, uh, you know, what wife is better than no wife, even if there's no dowry? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of confused. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about this sort of, and, and one of the things that you, you hear emerging from a lot of these, which seems natural, but also uh, is these anecdotal stories about men who are, you know, two men who now are now sharing a woman. Um, uh -huh. And you hear that out of China, too, but is that widespread, or did they find one guy, you know, right. uh, who's crazy and decided to, to do this? I'm sort of skeptical yeah. that that's, uh, it doesn't seem to have happened, say, like, in Arab countries where some men have ten wives and others have none. Right. Well, okay. I guess the mysteries of the East can be <laughs> yes, I'm not sure that we're not just and, now uh, showcasing our complete ignorance of any place that's not. No, no. But this is why people. I think I think since 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 we got a late stop start and and we don't know what we're talking about, maybe, maybe it's time to bring this to an end. Uh, okay. Well, did, did we have any other topics we were going to talk about? We're going to talk about the, the the monolithic coastal culture, right? Oh, the coastal coastal monoculture. <laughs> The allegedly right, coastal wait, monoculture, wait. which I don't think exists now, having moved to D.C. Oh, from see, I, I, I didn't even think that's what we were supposed to disagree about. Yes. Oh. Do you disagree with me? No, no see, you, don't, you, you don't disagree with me. You no, agree. so now we agree. Okay, so let's just say it for the viewers. <laughs> there is not a monolithic cultural, coastal culture. No, New York is definitely a much different place from Washington, D.C. Uh, right, and just try, try, try going to Providence sometimes. What? Try going to like Providence, Rhode Island. I have been to Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah, and it's nothing like New York. No. Um, no. Well, although I think that what they're referring to is sort of like people like you and me, like college educated people. You and I both grew up on. Um, I actually don't know where in New York City you grew up. You grew up on the Upper East Side, is that right? No, 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 12th Street. 12th Street. University so we both, we, we, we both went to, were expensively educated in New York's uh, independent school system. Uh, sure. And uh, we both went to decent colleges, um, and are supposed to, you know, now be sort of indistinguishable whether we happen to be living in New York, Boston, Washington D.C., or what have you. Um, but that's mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. not true. The, the 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 culture of these people in New York is different from the culture here. I think. Yes, they they walk fast. What? <laughs> They, 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 they walk much faster in New York. Well, they also... It's, it's freakish. I mean, people in, in Washington are much more relaxed. Like, they go out yes, more. They, they have much more sort of time to not be making money. Um, 
Um, and they spend a lot less yes. time on their clothes. Right, no. Well, you don't really have the whole, like, young moneymaker set nearly as much in, in, in Washington. You know? Yeah, except I guess lawyers the, working the, for lobbyists, and I don't know any of those people. Right, 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 right. Well, it's just they tend to be, I mean, because the typical Washington career trajectory is to sort of do something for a while and then cash in. You, you know, but to even, even when people do wind up cashing in, right, I mean, it's, it's they will um, work to become important and, you know, achieve the status that lets you cash in, mm-hmm. usually by working in relatively unremunerative sorts of jobs in politics, right, which is different from just sort of coming in as like a low-level cashing in person right. and then climbing the pyramid. So, so what's your plan for cashing in, Matt? My plan for cashing in? Well, I'm just, I'm awaiting my, my conversion to, to, to the right. I'm going to write a best-selling book about, like, union goons and uh, exposing left-wing bloggers and our ties to the mob. I'm glad you didn't say poker. No, no, poker. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at poker, <laughs> which is why I think I need to get out of hosting this poker game. Well, every time I, every time I play poker at your house, I lose money, so... Um, <laughs> I see. Right. Although, yes. I mean, the nice thing about uh, Washington is I lose half as much money as I would have lost in a similar poker game in New York. So, See, exactly. And that's what makes the coasts so diverse <laughs> and so wonderful. Different amounts of money in poker games. Um, no, but I, 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 I really should stop. Yes. Uh, I, sense, I sense a close. A, I feel some closure here. So, um, All right. All right. Uh, it's done. So, well, it's, it's been, what, what are we at, an hour now, or something like that? 50, 50, 50 minutes? 51 minutes. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's been good talking to you, Matt. Yes, yes, you too. And um, I'm sure I'll see you around in the, uh, the, the Washington, D.C. monoculture um, yes. fairly soon. And uh, have a, a, a lovely evening. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, bye.